the day that this book was born, really, was the day that I went to London and interviewed another great scientist on this, uh, Sir David King, who at that time in 2005 was the chief climate advisor, sorry, the chief science advisor, rather, to the British government. And uh, I was on assignment for Vanity Fair, and uh, it was right after Hurricane Katrina, and Vanity Fair had finally agreed to do a piece on global warming. And I had covered it for 15 years, and I thought I knew a thing or two about it. And boy, did I learn different that day. And uh, King was the one who said, uh, well, he basically shattered the framing that had existed up to that. Because the way I remember it as a reporter was from the time that you put that uh, testimony out. And to its great credit, the New York Times, the reason we know that Jim testified that way on June 23rd, 1988, was that the New York Times the next day ran that story on the front page. And in those pre-internet days, when the New York Times put a story on the front page above the fold, every news organization in the world saw it. Most of them repeated it in one form or another. And you could, I think, uh, quite uh, accurately say that by the time the week was out, global warming had gone from a thing that, that nobody had heard of to something that almost everybody had heard of. And uh, for the next 15 years, the argument was basically, you know, A, is Hansen right? And B, what do we do about it? And the presumption beneath, and correct me if I'm wrong about this, Jim, but, but uh, as a reporter, the way it looked was that the presumption was, on the part of, of the scientists, that this was a very grave problem, but it was a very distant problem. It was something that would not really hit until maybe 100 years in the future. The year 2100 was often used as a, as a marker date. And above all, it was a preventable problem if we got our act together and, and reduced the emissions. And when I saw David King that day in October 2005 in London, he said, in effect, sorry, we got part of that wrong. Yes, it's very dangerous, uh, but it's come a lot sooner than we expected, that global warming has triggered climate change 100 years sooner than we expected. And oh, by the way, the worst part of that is that once it's really begun, you can't call it back very quickly because of the inertia of the climate system, the fact that carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere so long, and so forth. And he said that uh, even if we stopped all the emissions tonight all over the world, that it would be 30 years before the temperatures stopped rising. So I walked out of his office that day with the, 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 the framing that I had covered that story for for 15 years was shattered. And I remember walking across the Westminster Bridge, and you read this, it's the opening scene in the book, in London. And uh, after about 10 minutes of sort of thinking through the implications of this, it, I was reminded by the shouts of children on the, on the London Eye Ferris wheel there across the river that, <clears throat> oh yeah, I'm a dad now. My daughter was four months old then. And that literally stopped me in my tracks. And the words came out of my mouth before I even thought about it. And I said, oh my god, Kiara has to live through this. And that was the moment where this book began, I think. And I realized that I had to do whatever I could to figure out what did it mean that this was happening and what could we do. So I, I will confess that I resisted a long time putting her into the book because I'm not None of my previous books have I ever written that personally. And I didn't want to intrude upon her privacy or our family's privacy. I worried about that. And um, I tried to write the book a different way, frankly, and wrote 140 pages and had to throw it away because <laughs> it wasn't right. There was not a voice there. And so finally, I surrendered to that fact that I did have to go back to that initial feeling of how will Kiara live through this? So that's why that book, I think, ended up focusing as much as it did on solutions as, uh, you know, because so many climate books, and understandably, talk about how the, the, the problem. And I wanted to acknowledge that, of course, but really to talk about what do we do about it. At the time I testified in 1988, I 
decided that that was, that was a good time to testify because we had a paper accepted for publication in the Journal of Geophysical Research, which I attached to the back of my testimony. And the day before my testimony, I called Rafe Pomerantz, who was an um, environmentalist uh, in Washington, and, and told him I was going to make a very strong statement. And, and so he should try to get the media to cover this. And so the, the, the New York Times reporter, and darn it, I can't think of his name right now, but he, he, he did a good job because he asked in the back of the room the right question. I said something like, it's time to stop waffling so much and say that the evidence is clear that humans are affecting the Earth's climate. And that's what he reported that. Phil Shabakov. Yeah, Shabakov, Phil mm -hmm. Shabakov. Uh, yeah, so he deserves credit, but so does uh, Rafe Pomerantz <laughs> for making sure that Shabakov was there and that the television cameras were there. But, you know, that the projections in that paper were right on the money. Uh, the problem is we just, uh, we scientists speak in a language which the public does not appreciate. You know, and we were, and we're, you know, we have the caveats and things, and and so, I even had on the key graph, I had a bar for, the, estimated temperature during the Alta Thermal and during the, Eemian, which 130,000 years ago, which was the prior interglacial period, that was warmer than the one that we're currently in. And, uh, you know, showing that, well, the temperature early in the 21st century is going to be reaching those levels, which has a lot of implications. For one thing, sea level was six meters higher. It doesn't mean that the ice sheets instantly melt, but it means that it's warm enough that if you wait a while, they are going to melt. We can't say exactly how long it takes, but so those things were actually there. But, but King was right about some things happened quicker than we thought. One of them is the melting of Arctic sea ice. That suddenly, you know, it was decreasing uh, each year, uh, it, it decreased like 15 percent, and then suddenly in 2007 it, it just uh, decreased 30 yeah, percent. Fell off a cliff. Fell off a cliff. Um, so, so there are part, and that end Another thing that surprised scientists was the stability of the ice sheets. How, you know, the, the, the models that scientists had of ice sheets were that they were like a big block of ice and they would slowly melt as it got warmer. But the disintegration of an ice sheet is a wet process and once it gets underway, it can go very rapidly. And what we now have measurements that um, show the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets are each losing mass at a rate of a couple of hundred cubic kilometers per year, which isn't very much. It's three mil in sea level. You spread all that all around the global ocean. It's three centimeters of sea level per decade, which is, you know, a little more than an inch. But it's 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 larger than it was 20 years ago, and there's the danger that. It's going to be an exponential process. And we know from the Earth's history that when ice sheets do begin to disintegrate, it can get out of control. And it will be out of the control of your daughter's uh, generation. And it will be a problem that this generation is creating. And that's the whole story. That this is an issue of intergenerational injustice. And in the case of our parents, they didn't know that they were causing a problem. But we know it now. The science is crystal clear. We are creating a problem for your daughter and my grandchildren. And I don't have any qualms about using <laughs> my grandchildren to try to pull on people's heartstrings because and draw attention to what you know? What we are doing to these young people—the the unfair um, bargain that we're handing them—that's um, the fundamental issue. And if people really understood this, 
I know, I know how my parents sacrificed for, and all, you know, all parents will sacrifice for their children. But yet in this case, it's not happening. And, and, it's, and it's this communication problem where, and again, I, I have to accept part of the blame. The scientists are not able to compete with the forces that prefer business as usual. They are Wait a minute, Jim. I want to stop you there because I think you would agree that it's in this country that there is still substantial controversy around this issue. In most other countries in the world, uh, there is a recognition that this is happening. If you, the Republican Party is the only major political party in the world that still denies this. If you look at the, the conservative parties in Britain and Germany and France, they haven't denied the science about this for a long time. So, and you spent a lot of time overseas. It's not just uh, an American issue here. A lot of people know it, and they are prepared to do something about it. So why isn't it happening? You know, that's, that's what I thought. And, that's, and I have gone to now seven or eight countries. It actually started in the same place you were, uh, in London. Um, I was asked to go over to give a talk there. And as I describe in my book, I we, uh, had the opportunity to speak to a group of very influential um, British uh, London people, and they wanted to do something about it. Um, and so I, at that time, realized that when you look at the uh, quantitatively where the carbon dioxide is coming from, the biggest problem is coal. We're going to run out of oil. Um, and the amount you get from gas is, is also limited even with the fracking of uh, uh, getting to get more gas. But, and so we, we decided to write a letter to uh, the British government to try to get them to close their, to stop their plans for a new coal-fired power plant. And uh, then I, then I, well, I was not completely happy with that letter, so I decided to write a letter myself to the Prime Minister. <laughs> and I did. And um, what, I, what I found, and, and I ended up writing a letter also to Prime Minister Merkel of Germany, and they asked me to come over and talk with their environment minister. But what I found is that these governments, although they will say they recognize the problem, it's basically a case of greenwash, where they say the right words and they take nominal actions which may sort of slow down the emissions a little bit, but it doesn't solve the problem. Um, and, and it's, you know, some governments are equally as bad as the United States. Australia, although they, the, the people actually elected a government which promised it was going to address this problem. As soon as it got in office, they sided with the coal industry, uh, which is very powerful in Australia. And um, yeah, but more recently, this is very new news out of Australia uh, because of the new elections. Now the Green Party is the kingmaker, and the same uh, Prime Minister, how do you pronounce her name, uh, Gilliard, is that it? I, She's just given quite an amazing speech coming out for a carbon tax, which yeah. in her election campaign she said she would never do. Now the Greens have forced her to do that. And she's saying all the things that, that uh, we would uh, agree with. So, so now we're going to see what happens. Mm. Because so far, <laughs> it has been every time the, the money talks and the fossil fuel industry has called the tune. Now let's see what happens there. Now that is actually the key thing. That's the most, the, the fundamental fact, as certain as the law of gravity, is that as long as fossil fuels are the cheapest energy, mm. we will keep burning them. Somebody will keep burning them. So it doesn't help that much. It's, it's great if people take individual actions to reduce their carbon emissions, but if fossil fuels are the cheapest energy, somebody else will burn them. By the time the tax gets up to $1 a gallon on gasoline, that's between 
two and a half and three thousand dollars per person for illegal residents of the United States. So they would get that dividend um, that much per year, distributed monthly with uh, a um, electronically to the bank account or debit card. And if that price were gradually rising, industry knew it was rising, the public knew it was going to rise, then we would get the changes. But the fossil fuel industry recognizes that would allow us to phase out our, our dependence, our addiction to fossil fuels. And they don't want it. They want to keep us addicted. Mm -hmm. And so far, governments have allowed them to call that tune. So it, it would be great. We need one country that would stand up and really tell the truth and, and try to get uh, international agreement to do that, but uh, so far I think, I think it's we not thought happened. we elected a guy in 2008 who was going to do that. In fact, I remember being on election night 2008 in Grant Park in Chicago, and covering that, um, and being astonished as a reporter who'd covered climate change for so long, being astonished to hear Barack Obama list as the three main challenges he faced as an incoming president. He mentioned, of course, the greatest financial crisis of our lifetimes, uh, the two wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, and, as he put it, a planet in peril. And he certainly had talked a good game. You remember, of course, when he was a candidate in 2008, he said that uh, he would uh, demand on the 100% uh, of, uh, of the, uh, he did back cap and trade, but it was going to be 100% pass through to the public and all of that. And boy, has that not turned out to be the case. Yeah. Yeah, he had... Um, <coughs> yeah. Not a lot more you can say than that, is there? <laughs> well, it, actually, you can say more. The thing is, he had the opportunity, but, you know, he was not well advised, and we didn't, we didn't realize that his approach was you know, let people discuss and, and compromise. And then he took the advice for this cap-and-trade with offsets, which is a half-baked uh, industry-influenced 2,000-page long bill coming out of Congress, which has got every lobbyist has got his uh, fingers into the, the story. What you need is a simple, honest carbon price, no exceptions. It's across the board at the mine, and then it will affect energy. Any energy that uses the fossil fuel will be affected. But if the money is given to the public, 60% of the public would get more in their dividend than they would be paying in increased energy prices. But as that price went up, it would drive out fossil fuels. That's the kind of thing, and so I actually am now more hopeful. There's there's a possibility that it could actually be the other party. I mean, you pointed at Republicans, but once they realize that it's inevitable, you know that the the there's actually an article written by uh, Jim DePeso, who's the head of uh, Republicans for the Environment. Now it might be a small group. A little small. <laughs> they are a little small, well, I, I mean, conservatives actually should believe in uh, protecting uh, the, the earth, you know. And they should believe in limited government as well. They should believe in, right. in privacy and rights as well, but they that's don't. That's right. That's exactly why you want a simple uh, thing that keeps the government out. You just collect this fee. And you just have to, it's this, this long division. You divide by the number of legal residents, mm -hmm. and, and it's simple. And, it, and the article that he wrote was, this suggestion by Jim Hansen is exactly what conservatives should support. And I think they will once they understand that. But they kind of need to have it as their idea, rather than coming from the Democrats. And if the Democrats are suggesting cap and trade with offsets, then they could have a much better plan. And just like um, some previous, didn't uh, 
Nixon introduced some good ideas. Sometimes it's the opposite party. Even you, you're surprised <laughs> by who. Starts. Yeah, but the reason that Nixon did that, and I think it bears on our moment today. Richard Nixon was indeed the the, the Earth the, Day. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. it was Earth Day, and he saw, and we now know this from the memoirs of of people in his administration, especially Russell Train, who was the EPA guy then. Um, and who would have thunk that uh, John Ehrlichman was a closet environmentalist? He was the go-to guy in the White House when they needed to get something done inside of the administration. But why did Nixon do that? Because Nixon was a politician. And he was calculating his re-election in 1972. And he looked at Earth Day, and he saw that there were literally millions of people in the streets, especially young people. And there were already, as many people in this room will recall, a lot of people in the streets around the war, around civil rights and other issues. And Nixon was afraid that if he didn't take the environment issue, that the Democrats would in 1972. And so he decided he was going to be in favor of all these things and passed all of these laws. And so I think that that's really, and not just me, Bill McKibben just wrote uh, very eloquently about this, that uh, if we're going to get this, and uh, whether it come from Republicans or Democrats, uh, doesn't really matter. But if we're going to get movement, there has got to be that kind of fear put into the hearts of politicians that if they don't do this, they will be uh, voted out of office. That is the only language that they understand. So I am going, in fact, to Washington tomorrow to cover a conference called Power Shift. I don't know how many people here know. Anybody here know about Power Shift? Anna does, of course, because she'll be there. But uh, uh, anyway, Power Shift are the young, mainly the young activists, climate activists. And they are going to be uh, deciding what to do. And there's a lot more ferment now, I think, inside of the movement and arguing in favor of that kind of approach that will uh, scare <clears throat> the politicians into doing this. And it recalls one other thing I want to ask you about, Jim, because you've been a part of it. We it's important for us to recognize, I think, that there have been some very important victories on this front. Uh, in this country, the de facto moratorium that has been put in place on new coal-fired power plants over the last couple of years, we basically stopped uh, 130 and counting, 130 coal-fired power plants that were planned or in some form of, of, uh, of uh, preparation. And largely it's happened, and you've been at some of these demonstrations, it's largely happened because of grassroots pressure that has been multi-issues. It's not just enviros. It's environmentalists. It's the American Lung Association. It's the nurses. It was the mayor of Dallas, Texas, of all places. Uh, labor organizations of faith who have come together, not arguing in Washington, where, let's remember, uh, that game is rigged against us. Corporate power has far more sway in Washington. At the grassroots is where people power is more able to assert itself. You've been part of some of those demonstrations. And I wanted to ask you, do you see that as, A, the kind of victory that I'm describing it as, and B, as a, does that give us some, uh, some guidance as to uh, what strategies are going to work going forward? Um, well, you're basically, your main point is, of course, right, that we have to get young people to understand what's at stake for them and to put pressure on the system through the democratic process and, and uh, probably in the street. But they need to understand what is needed. What happened in 2008 was after the election, the young people that stayed involved, I, I remember I, was, I spoke at Virginia Tech before the election, and, I was, I was, and some other places also. And I noticed I, how enthusiastic the students were for Obama's uh, candidacy, and they were out they deserve an enormous portion of the credit for his election because they got out the vote. And, uh, but then after the election, they didn't get their due. And in fact, they didn't know what their due should be. That's the problem. They ended up supporting 
cap and trade with offsets, a half-baked uh, approach that wouldn't have solved the problem anyway. I don't think that the youth supported that. I think the big green groups did, and yes, the younger yes, activists yes, on the climate they, side yeah, right, exactly. opposed that, and they got, frankly, well, shut down by a lot of the funders who said, we're not going to fund you if you don't play ball with the rest of the movement. Well, some of them, but I, I couldn't, um, even even uh, 350.org, you know, and, and by the way, the, the royalties from my book go 100% to 350.org, because that's the, Bill McKibben's group is the, most effective group that I know in getting the public to be aware of this whole story. But they, and, and their argument was that, well, they've gone all around the world to these different places, and every country says, well, how can we do anything if the United States is, is refusing to do anything? And therefore, if Congress does anything at all, that's very helpful. So we'll, so we'll push for that. But the f fact is, we have to actually address the fundamental problem, and that requires putting a price on, on carbon. And the Democratic Party was scared to death of the word tax. If you call it a carbon tax, you know, we, that, we can't do that. We've got to pretend that you don't need a tax. We're going to have a cap. If the cap doesn't cause the price of the fuel to go up, then it's worthless. And you have to be honest about that. But if the money is not given to your favorite lobbyist, but instead is given to the public, then you can both get at something that works, and you can do it not on the backs of the public. So they got to, they, you know, it's, it's not enough that young people say they want the problem solved. They have to have to look at what the governments are doing and make sure they're doing something that will work. I want to ask you another question about your reaction to my book, but maybe you have, did you have another question you wanted to ask first about it? Because I'm, I'm curious about one thing that I suspect you disagree with. Oh, yeah, that's, that's the, uh, uh -oh. that's probably. See, I told uh, you. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm afraid we do uh, disagree. But you, you do, in your book, make a strong case, and I understand that, and um, for adaptation. And let's so be clear to people what adaptation is. That's quite different than, than mitigation. These are unfortunate words, perhaps. They're somewhat technical. But most of what you have heard about and what you think about in terms of climate policy is what scientists call mitigation. And that has to do with reducing the emissions uh, or somehow reducing the concentration of the greenhouse gases up in the atmosphere. And by doing that, you will, therefore, uh, eventually reduce the temperatures. Adaptation. So in a, in a sense, that's I call that the front end of the problem, and that's most of what we've been focused on for the last years, not doing much, but at least talking about. Adaptation is the back end of the problem, and that is uh, coping with and putting in place protections against the impacts that are now unavoidable over the next 50 plus years. And that includes things like, uh, and I write about this in the book, what they're doing in uh, the Netherlands, for example. They have a 200-year plan to adapt to climate change by increasing the strength of their sea defenses. Or uh, in Seattle, King County, Washington, which I write about a lot, they are uh, putting in levees along their rivers. They are buying up 100,000 acres of forest land up in the Cascade Mountains in order to try and when, when they do lose the snowpack up there because of the rising temperatures, they hope that having healthy forests will, in effect, act as a sponge, hold that water, so that instead of it just flushing off into the sea, it will be there for human use. So mitigation and adaptation, and I did anticipate that you would probably disagree with as much of a focus on adaptation as, as this book gives. Is well, that? Of course, of course, you're right that people should um, be taking steps now because it takes time to put in place the measures for adaptation. And you're also right that they're going to have to do that because there, there is climate change that's in the pipeline and which is going to happen even if we have very strong mitigation efforts. Uh, but I don't like to take the focus off mitigation, because that is actually what's happening on the international scene. 
um, at the Copenhagen uh, negotiations, you could see exactly what was the, the United States Senate Secretary Clinton came with this offer, $100 billion a year, to the developing nations for adaptation. Now, this is exactly analogous to the indulgences of the Middle Ages, where you were able to purchase, you are able to buy, you are able to, the sinners would, uh, at the end of the year, pay the church for their sins, and then they could continue to do their sinning. <laughs> and everybody was happy. The sinners got to enjoy their sins, and the church got the money that it, it sought. Uh, unfortunate, and unfortunately, in this case, the developing countries are not going to get that $100 billion. If the, we, we can calculate very precisely who, what the bill is for each country, because we know how much fossil fuels have been burned and what their contribution is to the um, climate's energy imbalance and, and climate change. The United States portion is 27 percent, 27 billion dollars per year to developing countries. What is the chance that Congress will vote this? Zero. It's not happening. Hillary Clinton can promise it all she wants. It's not going to happen. In fact, if you just a couple days ago, this bill, which is going to be, I think, uh, approved today, it may have already been approved, it has a reduction and all money going out from the United States to other countries. We're, we've always, in recent years, our percentage of foreign aid of our, compared to our economy and compared to other countries, has been very small, and it's, and it's going to get even smaller. So the chance that $27 billion will be coughed up to developing countries is it's not going to happen. But, but anyway, but what that allows is for the the U.S. and other countries just continue what they're doing. That's why we just signed an agreement with Canada for a pipeline to carry tar sands oil to the Texas oil refineries. We, and that's what we can't do. We cannot develop these unconventional fossil fuels and continue to burn all the coal. And even though we stopped these actions in the street helped perhaps, to stop the plans for new coal-fired power plants in the U.S., but our production of coal is going up and it's, it's being sent to other countries. Uh, we're sending coal to China. Uh, so we've got to, <laughs> we can't let adaptation, uh, uh, presumed measures for adaptation, take away the attention from the fact that we've got to solve the emissions problem or the game is over. Uh, you cannot you know, Jim, have. I, I, would, I hear this because I hear this from a lot of other environmentalists who have, who have said this. And uh, in fact, during the 90s, there's a passage in the book where it, there's a quote that says, I was called a traitor because, and this was uh, a scientist in Germany who was saying we need to do both mitigation and adaptation. But a lot of activists said, anybody talking about adaptation, you are a traitor to the cause because you are withdrawing attention, you're giving a, an out for these uh, 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 polluters and so forth in the Bush administration and so forth. And, and, and I recognize that. But I also think you can frame the problem a little bit differently and look at it from the standpoint of human solidarity. And the fact is that, you know, my daughter's counterpart, a little girl I write about in this book, Uma, in Bangladesh, and those other children, they are going to be punished by the climate change that is now inevitable. We do, in fact, owe them climate reparations. And adaptation uh, is, is, to me, the least of what can be done. And I also would reject the idea that we can only do one or the other. We can only have uh, adaptation or mitigation. I think it's it's a much tougher pull to say that we need both, um, but it is I think both uh, intellectually wrong and also as a practical matter it's wrong to think that we can't do both. A lot of the budget uh, 
uh, a lot of the money that will come for adaptation you know, comes out of different budgets anyway. And I don't see how we, in the name of justice, cannot pay that kind of, of cost. And why can't we do adaptation and mitigation at the same time? Well, the point is, I've already made the point, that you will, it allows governments to continue to ignore the mitigation problem. Of course, you have to do both because climate change is already in the pipeline. Mm -hmm. And so you, you're going to have to um, ad adapt. Uh, but it's a question of emphasis. I, um, but, but I don't think, you know, that $100 billion, it's not accurate to say that that's only for adaptation. That is actually for adaptation and mitigation. But the caveat is it's mitigation on the part of the poor countries, yeah, right. not us, <laughs> right? That $100 billion is supposed to help uh, developing countries around the world not just to adapt, but to switch to green energies. And I yield to no one in my uh, cynicism about, you know, what, what Western aid does. It is mainly not about aiding poor countries. It is about enriching our contractors and all of that. But to me, that is more of an argument for us saying, no, that's not how you do it, and for the climate movement, which is now in existence globally to say, no, this needs to be done properly, and you Westerners have to step up to the plate and do the right thing. It's about, you're right, it's about enriching contractors, but also it's about those leaders of developing countries who want to see this money. It'll do, personally, they will benefit very well from, from such adaptation funds, even if it's, they're moderate. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, Again, we have to keep our eye on the ball. And the ball is you've got to have a price on fossil fuels. As long as you're subsidizing them and sure. they're the cheapest energy, the problem will not be solved. So and how do we get a price? Because I totally agree with you. In fact, I write about this in the book that what we need is exactly what you're talking about, a, whether you call it a, you know, a cap and dividend or what have you. But if what you're saying about Washington, and what I'm saying for that matter about Washington, as being in effect, a, uh, a corporate-run uh, place, and especially, let's remember that the oil industry is the single richest business enterprise in the history of humanity. How do we get our elected representatives to agree to what amounts to a, a tax on carbon? We, we had one opportunity in 2008. It requires a president who will be a populist president. He has to say what the truth is, and he has to explain it to the public, like Franklin Roosevelt. You have the fireside chat. You say we've got a fossil fuel addiction. It has enormous disadvantages for presently. It requires us to have a military protecting supply lines all around the world. It requires, um, it's, and, it, and it's uh, sentencing our children and grandchildren to a future which is much more <laughs> poor than, than our lifestyle. But so Obama's has, given that speech, say, Jim. He's given the speech. He's not executed it as a president. He gives that yes, speech. Yes, because... And he doesn't know, follow and, through. Well, you know, it's because the people who should be helping him are not telling the whole story. You know, they're saying, well, we can solve it with solar panels and we can uh, uh, have these green energy and with these green jobs and that'll solve it. Um, unfortunately, that's not, that's not going to work. The, 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 I, you know, I spent, I got some award money the last year and I've spent half of it on renewable energies, on solar panels, on my barn and on my daughter's house and and I'm uh, now looking into geothermal uh, and the other half on my grandchildren's uh, education funds but it, I can tell you it's it only makes sense because we get a rebate from the state and we get a tax saying it's actually it's not competitive it's until you get a price on carbon you cannot the, these renewables cannot compete with uh, subsidized fossil fuels. So again, back to the fundamental fact, as long as fossil fuels are the cheapest energy, somebody's going to keep burning them. We've got to get, um, so we have to have a president who will explain that and actually do that instead of talking about, oh, we will provide some incentives for um, 
wind and solar. That's that's uh, not going to solve it. Nancy, yes, do you want to? Um, we're sort of. Well, here's what I think. We should, here's what I think we should do next. Um, there probably are a number of comments and questions in the audience, and I would encourage anybody who has a comment or a question to come up to the podium and start lining up. We need you to use the microphone. Um, and while you're assembling yourselves, I might ask the first question. Um, so one thing that I'm really curious about listening to each of you talk is that um, both of you have sort of gone over the edge from objectivity or the objective um, pursuits that go with your chosen professions, whether it's journalism or, or science. And I think it would be really interesting to hear you each talk a little bit, just reflect on what it is that pushed you over that edge, which I imagine was a somewhat difficult decision, or maybe it wasn't difficult. Um, but what pushed you over the edge, and, and, and what, if any, are the, are the ramifications for the work that you do um, in those chosen careers. And obviously, Bill McKibben is another one who's in a similar situation. And I could name other journalists who've made the choice not to, to make that leap, even though they, like you, are well aware of what's happening and how serious it is. And certainly, there are many scientists who are quite uncomfortable on the, on the advocacy side of the line. So if you could just like, reflect on that a little bit, it would be really interesting. Most of the time, objectivity is simply an excuse for regurgitating the official can't, great word, can't of the day. And in particular, I would add that especially, I was writing about the Washington Press Corps, objectivity generally meant reporting what the uh, center of gravity within uh, Washington said. And so, and not going beyond that. So to give an example, if the Republicans wake up in the morning and say that the, the sky is yellow today, uh, and the Democrats say, no, it's not yellow. Anyone can see that it's, that it's uh, uh, brown. The press will not point out until about the 15th paragraph of the story on the jump page at the bottom of the article that nobody gets to that uh, independent scientists have said that the sky is actually blue. The press will not say that. The press reports what Power Group A in Washington says and Power Group B, generally the president and the opposition party, which is why, by the way, a general rule of thumb in watching how press coverage works for any president is that it is only as critical as the opposition party is critical, which is why Ronald Reagan did not have a critical press, why Bill Clinton did have a critical press, why Barack Obama is having a critical press, why George W. Bush did not have a critical press, because they did not face an opposition party that was willing to criticize. And journalists, in the name of objectivity, feel like they cannot say that the sky is blue and the grass is green if they don't have an official to say that. I never believed that. So in a way, it was easier for me at a fairly recent point, and really it was with the publication of this book, that I decided that I did have to be more, what, uh, transparent about my advocacy role and frankly, becoming a, a father. And knowing what I know about this issue, I could not live with myself as a dad if I did not do more. That's, that's very interesting. Um, and and I'm, uh, a very useful perspective. Um, now, from the scientist perspective, we cannot succeed as a scientist if we're not objective. That's what that's how science works. We have to be open-minded and whenever there's a new piece of data that comes in, we have to examine our previous interpretations and adjust them if that data calls for it. Because that's science is just an attempt to explain the real world. So you, when you get real world data, you, you you've got to adjust your um thinking to um be consistent with um, all the evidence at hand. And good scientists do that. Um, what I realized was that the politicians only want you to go, the scientists, to go so far. Don't connect the dots 
all the way to the policies because they want to do that themselves. So tell they'll, they're happy to hear that climate is a problem or whatever, but just don't tell them what that means uh, for policies. Or, and what I finally realized and what caused me to, you know, after this testimony in 1988, I, I really, all the st stuff that came with it made me realize I didn't want to be involved in uh, the public discussion. It was actually the, by the next year, 1989, I had another testimony to Al Gore's committee. The one in 1988 was to Tim Worth. But, and, and in that one, I pointed out that my testimony had been changed by the White House. <laughs> Because, as I say, not only do they not want you to connect the dots, they want to connect them their own direction. So, so they changed my testimony. Well, that, of course, caused lots of problems. So I decided at that point I'm not going to be involved in public discussion anymore. I'm going to just go back to the laboratory and, and work on the science, because that's really interesting science. And for 15 years, I maintained that um, vow, and I did not accept request to do television interviews or even documentaries. I recall. Beca because there were better, the scientists, <laughs> <laughs> there were scientists who would do it much better than me, like Steve Schneider and, and so. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have Carl Sagan anymore, so uh, scientists' uh, ability to communicate is limited. But anyway, in 2004, I explicitly remember, you know, that I, at after I had had lots of chances to speak to the Bush administration and try to explain what the story was and realized that they were not doing anything, um, I decided to give one talk. And um, I rationalized it to myself by saying that I didn't want my grandchildren to say, Opa understood what was happening, but he didn't uh, try to make it clear. And so I decided to try to make it clear. And I thought it was just going to be one talk. But it turned out, uh, obviously, I again realized this communication is really tough. <laughs> and, and to get the public to understand the situation is really hard. And I still, we're still, we're, we're actually losing the, the battle. Over the last couple of years, we've gone backward. The um, forces that prefer business as usual have been very clever. They've convinced a lot of the public that this is all a hoax. Uh, it's much more convenient for the public to think it might be a hoax. Even if they don't know it's a hoax, they think, well, maybe it is. We better wait and see. Unfortunately, waiting and seeing is not a good strategy. No. <laughs> no. Thank you. That was really interesting. So let's go to questions from all of you. And if you want to, please tell us who you are and what, what, from what perspective maybe you're asking your question. Uh, Paul Pelliquin, uh, just a citizen from Brooklyn, New York. Uh, tax and dividend is a pretty wonky proposal, and uh, it invites getting into a wrestling match with someone from Cato. How about something uh, simpler like uh, let's nationalize all the oil companies and because they're a danger to the planet because we have to use their profits uh, uh, to create a uh, solar uh, society and economy. Thank you. Well, neither party would, uh, Republicans are not going to let you nationalize <laughs> the oil anything. companies. Anything. Uh, They're not in favor of nationalizing anything. Th that's just the opposite of it. So I do, I actually have this article by um, the Republican, Republicans in, for Environmental Protection. As I say, I don't know how big this group is, but they, they say that uh, it's this proposal, a fee collected from the fossil fuel companies and distributed money distributed to the public is transparent, it's market-based, it does not enlarge the government, it leaves the inner de decisions to individual choices, it takes a better safe than sorry approach uh, toward a climate problem. And he says, that sounds like a conservative plan to me. And um, that's... I. That's my hope. That well, there's no conservatives left in the Republican Party. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Joanna Weschler, and I work in the area of international peace and security. And uh, uh, Mr. Hansen, you blamed 
in part yourself and the science for not being able to convey the proper message in 1988. I think actually that A, you are unfair to yourself and science, and B, the problem is considerably deeper. I happen to be part of a conversation today, earlier today, with someone who a little bit over a year ago participated in Washington in a pretty senior summit of world leaders on nuclear threat. And he described something that really sounded to me like a very scary scene. The president asked everybody in the room to describe their individual countries, and there were some almost 50 different world leaders in the room, describe their way of dealing with nu nuclear threat that could be a lesson for others and could be adopted by others. And apparently, almost nobody in that room was able to give an answer because they are not used to speaking without written speeches. They are just not able to respond to questions. And what it means, I think, to me, but probably to many other people, is that we are currently dealing with a very serious crisis in global governance, that the quality of world leaders is really not up the standard to be able to respond to issues such as, for instance, global threat, uh, I mean, uh, climate uh, uh, change threat. So I think uh, one of the things that we, we need to talk about is what needs to be done with the overall democratic system to produce leaders who are not dumbed down but are smart enough to deal with issues that 50 years ago nobody thought about. Does either of you want to comment on that? <laughs> well, I, I have a comment. Do you, Go ahead, you, uh, on one of my slides I had, we're, we're waiting for Winston Churchill. Uh, but it, it, we don't seem to have a Winston Churchill at, at the moment. Um, but of course, Winston Churchill could point to the Nazis across the channel. It's, it was a lot easier, uh, easier problem <laughs> to, to make the public uh, realize they've got to do something. Um, um, I forgot what the other half of my answer was. Um, You can try. Let me think. I had another part to answer, but I... No, I have nothing to add to that, really. I mean, I, I, I only would say that, that is, let's be careful. That there have been a lot of world leaders who have said the right thing on this, including uh, conservative parties. Let's never forget, Margaret Thatcher was the first person to give a tough speech in, was it 1989 or 90, uh, about the need to deal with global warming. And no matter what it cost, by the way, she said, because she was trained as a, was it a chemist, I believe, or a physicist? Chemist. Merkel's the physicist. And she said that as a conservative. So um, it is simply very difficult when you face, as I said before, the single richest business enterprise in the history of the planet they are prepared to spend a lot of money. So that even somebody like Barack Obama, who I'm convinced understands this problem intellectually, does not really step up to the plate with the kind of, of guts and fortitude and, uh, frankly, leadership that it would take. Yeah, now I remember the other part of my answer. Um, Glad to help you out there, Jim. Um, <laughs> Well, what I point out in my book is that, yeah, there are a lot of leaders who say the right words. They say we have a planet in peril. But they're, it's basically greenwash because they're not, not taking on uh, the fossil fuel industry. And they're not in money talks in Washington and other capitals around the world. And um, the policies are not far from business as usual. They propose things which are perturbations to business as usual, but they're not solutions. Now, there is one hope. I, the the um, brightest thing that I see on the horizon is the fact that China, 
seems to be less influenced by even in even in China the <laughs> industries have some uh, influence on the government, but they uh, they are not denying the science. In fact, they're very interested in the best scientific advice they can get, and they invite it in and invite scientists in and. Um, and listen, I think, uh, with an open mind. And the, the leaders, although it's not a democratic country, on the contrary, uh, but it's the leaders happen to be basically engineers. And they're, uh, they're now the number one investors in solar power, uh, wind power, and nuclear power. And efficiency there, world. And uh, efficiency. Yeah. So they... Uh, that so there are some governments that are not denying the problem. And they have good reasons to be uh, concerned because they have 300 million people who live near sea level. They've got very bad air pollution, and they they can see that they don't want to have the fossil fuel addiction, which then requires a military to protect the supply lines. And there's those fossil fuels are finite anyhow. So there's some hope, but. Um, on the other hand, they're burning a lot of coal. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks. Let's go to another question. <clears throat> I'm Winifred Armstrong. I worked 10 years ago on the first New York State uh, climate change act action plan, uh, actually with some of the people in this room, um, including colleagues of, of Jim Hansen. Uh, and I'll correct a little bit of the record, Mark. We were then. That was 99, 2000, and we did deal with both mitigation and adaptation, or we tried to. Good for you. Race. Good for I you. Don't, I don't mean we did it, but it I'm was glad on. To hear that. <laughs> uh, the that brought together a lot of the city agencies, the power companies, and the environmental organizations, all in making recommendations, looking at their own operations, basically, and seeing how they were affected. Were, were now and would be affected by climate change and how they would adapt to that in their, in their policies and operations. So we worked on the science, the policy, the operations, and how the jobs would change and who would talk to whom among the agencies. And that set a base, was part of anyway, the basis for the New York City Sustainability Plan, which is now, as you know, in its second round and you should make your input actually, because this is the time. That leads me to, the, to pulling out two questions from what you already said, but I'd like you to amplify if you would. One is a lot of the, a lot of the hard work is being done at the city and state levels, village, state, and town levels. And that, how does my job change? What do I do? Which is minor in terms of its effect, Jim, as you point out but perhaps major in terms of the politics, and I don't think we have built on that, and I'd like you to address that if you would. And secondly, I'm, I'm a dissatisfied ecological economist. Any ecological economist is gonna be dissatisfied. Uh, <laughs> we don't have the right measures, and you have, you have alluded to that but I think until, until we face what are the costs and what are the benefits as part of the operational way in which we look at this stuff, we're going to be talking pie in the sky. Please comment. I think the, the latter is right. I, I imagine Jim agrees with that, too. We do need honest pricing. And I, you know, Jim has said this a number of times tonight, and I just want to make clear I completely agree. We need a rising price on carbon. Uh, the question is how we get that. That's a, a question of political strategy, I think, that we still have to work on. Um, on the second thing, I, uh, I'm so glad you mentioned the work of the cities and the regions, because it is one of the other areas of real hope, I think. Uh, there's a group called C40, which is 40 cities around the world, and a group called R20, which is 20 regions around the world, including my home state of California. I just uh, read that yesterday, uh, President, former President Clinton and Mayor Bloomberg came together here in New York to announce that those two groups will now merge. And what's exciting about that 
is that uh, you put those 40 cities and 20 regions together and you have got the lion's share of the greenhouse gas emissions on this planet. You also got uh, political leaders who are, are very attuned to the necessity for adaptation because it's at the local level that they're going to have to be dealing with the sea level rise, with the heat waves, with the flooding and so forth. So I see that as uh, enormously hopeful and as this, the single most important, if you will, end run around the current blockage in Washington, D.C. Yeah, I would like to uh, agree with that and, and uh, uh, congratulate you for that kind of effort because I think that is, it's important for a number of reasons, but for one thing it makes clear that things can be done uh, and it makes the people who are then involved in that then realize that, well, the policies that are needed actually could work on a larger scale. Um, and there are, and it is also an example of the fact that there are politicians who are not just greenwashing. And Mayor Bloomberg should be congratulated for uh, his really being serious about this issue. Um, and frankly, uh, one of the things that I say in my book is that we need a third party in the United States because it, it's just not working with these two parties just more interested in making the other party look bad rather than in doing what is needed for the country and, and the world. But, and I think Mayor Bloomberg also recognizes that and is actually organized discussions about a possible third party. But um, yeah, I think this is, it is um, one of the reasons for optimism that there is some of this activity on local and regional basis. Hi, um, my name is John Breitbart. Um, Dr. Hansen, I spent last spring and summer getting through your book and uh, I'm a school teacher in New York City, a science teacher. Um, also, I've been involved in environmental issues for some time, so I just wanted to throw out some thoughts about, and Mark, your book on, on Bended Knee has been on my bookshelf for a long time. Um, if we're looking for a, a, politic, a democratic political response to the situation, it escapes me how we're going to overcome the censorship and limitations of our human consciousness concentration mechanism called the media. In other words, um, that famous quote from 1984 in Orwell's book, um, he who controls the present controls the past, and he who controls the past controls the future. Um, the convincing of the general pu public or uh, that there's confusion about global warming and what's causing it has been very successful, and I think as somebody who's belonged to an environmental movement that, I'll just say, you know, I was one of the 600 people who climbed the fence at the Shoreham nuclear power plant back in uh -huh. 1979, um, and then spent the next seven or eight years uh, running a bookmobile in New York City called Options for the Future that we narrowly didn't name uh, Last Chance. Um, Basically, we gave it up in 1990 because it became a clear that, that what Bush Sr. meant by the New World Order was a kind of ultimate total control over the flow of information to the general public. So if those who are most powerful and most, um, most endowed in our society are controlling the means of communication largely, uh, it also means that they're probably going to control the ultimate scenario for how the shortages and the problems of global warming play out. Um, we had Hollywood produce an apocalypse movie called 2012, which I, I saw because I love animation. And um, what was fascinating to me is that by the end of the movie, you were rooting for the people who survived the apocalypse. And who are these people? The movie was quite public about this. They were the richest, most powerful people who could afford the tickets on those wonderful arcs that would survive the apocalypse. And so 
the control of mass consciousness through a corporate controlled media is a problem that somehow needs to be addressed. Nader's just written his book, uh, Only the Super Rich Can Save Us. Maybe, uh, maybe that's worth reading. But um, I think you're pointing uh, the, to some yeah, really there's interesting a, stuff. Is there's there, a possibility is there a of fascism on the horizon, I guess. Because when mm. push comes to shove, we can talk about justice, but when the lifeboat doesn't hold everybody, how is that going to play out politically, and how would anybody prevent it from playing out that way? So that's, that's my main question. And then as a former anti-nuclear activist, I want to ask Dr. Hansen if he's had any second thoughts on his feelings about nuclear energy after Fukushima. I'll deal with the media one, um, and I'll be interested in what Jim says about Fukushima since I just wrote about that in The Nation magazine, and uh, uh, in which I noted that, that some environmentalists are actually choosing Fukushima as a time to say that they've uh, decided that, that nuclear really, this is convinced them that nuclear has to be part of the solution to climate change interesting time to make that decision. Uh, on the media side, uh, you read my book on Bend and Knee, so you know that I'm, I'm extremely critical about the media concentration and the corporate control and so forth. But it is very important that we not grant them more power in our own minds than they have. And with all due respect, a question like yours does that. If it were quite as uh, all-encompassing and irreversible as that question implies, there would be no C40 uh, leaders around the world, mayors who genuinely do want to do the right thing and are doing the right thing. Likewise in California, where our media too is controlled by the usual suspects. California, we have passed a uh, climate bill. We are pushing ahead. We, we defeated the Koch brothers in November, last November, by 20 points, I'll add, in their effort to overturn that law. Is that law perfect? No. But it is a very important step. There are contending power uh, groups in the society, and part of the reason that we won in California is that there is an enormous amount of money right now coming out of Silicon Valley capitalists who recognize the same thing that the Chinese do and the Germans do, which is that the green economy is the big economic prize for the 21st century, and those Silicon Valley capitalists want to win that prize in California. And they bankrolled the fight against Prop 23. So if the media was as all-powerful as it's sometimes easy to think that it is, those kinds of things wouldn't happen. It's very important when you are fighting a big, powerful enemy, do not make them more powerful in your mind than they really are. That's a great message, um, which I, we have to keep in mind, because it is easy to, um, to, to see how powerful the fossil fuel interests are, but they're not all powerful. Um, but let me, uh, you, you ask about the uh, nuclear situation. It's very analogous uh, to the discussion. And again, it relates to the public uh, discussion, the perceptions uh, the, that are created. It's very analogous. The anti-nuclear people their ability to control the public discussion is very analogous to the way the contrarians uh, in the climate debate uh, deal with it. You, they just completely ignore the science uh, and just make up numbers out of whole cloth. For example, in the United States, we've had, we have more nuclear reactors than any country in the world. Uh, about a hundred, and we've had one uh, substantial accident at Three Mile Island. The number of people killed by that accident was zero. Uh, the National Academy of Science has estimated that the people who are exposed to radiation in Pennsylvania could, 
by the time all the people have uh, lived out their lives, there could be one or two that die earlier than they would have uh, if it hadn't been for that release of that radiation. And the same population of Pennsylvanians, 40,000 will die of cancer for other uh, causes of cancer. Um, the um, nuclear industry is the safest, has the safest, best safety record of any industry in the United States. Uh, but uh, that is, those kind of facts are, uh, and of course, yeah, if you're going to have a nuclear, you should now, based on what happened in Japan, you should ask if you're living next to a nuclear power plant, is there a chance that that nuclear power plant will have an a earthquake of magnitude 9 and a tsunami of uh, 35 feet height? Um, and if there is a danger, if it is in a location where that's possible, well, y y you should take some safety measures. But the fact is that the successive generations of nuclear power are considerably advanced. The, the whole idea of the third generation, which is still the light water reactors, they will be passively safe in the sense that they don't require energy for a cooling system if, there's, if they're shut off. And they can just, the, the Jap, even the Japanese reactors, which were not the best of the second generation, they did, uh, they were designed to withstand an 8.2 magnitude earthquake, and they actually survived the 9 magnitude earthquake. That was not a problem. What was a problem was a tsunami, which wiped out their, their power and their ability to cool the reactors. Well, so the, th the third generation will be passively safe in the sense that it doesn't require any power to keep uh, the reactors cool if they have to be shut down. But more than that is the potential for fourth generation reactors, which can burn nuclear waste and solve the biggest problem with nuclear power. So to just automatically, I mean, the fear mongering that goes on with nuclear power is just unbelievable. There's a woman by the name of Caldecott in Australia. She, she goes around and she just makes up numbers out of whole cloth. There have absolutely no scientific basis, but it's become a religion. When I gave talks in Australia, I had people lined up protesting my talk because they knew that I had said something positive about uh, the potential of nuclear power. Well, it's a religion. Uh, you know, we need to be objective. That's all that I'm saying. And uh, that, uh, I think, and it's, but it's the way that the media reports this kind of thing is, is it's very difficult because they, they make the thing in Japan sound like, and even that, you know, the amount of radiation released is about so far. You know, I really don't want to write about this until the, the whole story is out, the complete Japanese story is finished so that we can be uh, objective um, in discussing it. But so far, the amount of radiation released is 10 times less than uh, in the Russian accident, which was, you know, the, the worst generation of nuclear power plant that you can imagine. They didn't even have a containment vessel. But uh, it's, uh, it's really unfortunate. Do you notice that the Japanese authorities have now said that Fukushima was at the same uh, level of urgency, or of, of gravity, rather, as that's, uh, that's you what think the they're media, overreacting? That's, that's what the media said. No, no, no. That's no, what no, the Japanese no, authorities no, no, said. No, 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 no. Yesterday, the, they, they gave the numbers. It's a factor, and they give it this very clear, the factor of 10 smaller than the uh, sure Russian uh, uh, accident. And furthermore, they say that each of, and they say the reason they made it this Category 7 is because uh, there were three reactors, each of right. which was a Category 5. But together, they decided to right. classify it as Category 7. But what is the impact of that? How many people are going to die from that radiation? It's, it's you know, if you, a million people per year die from the, the material 
produced by fossil fuel burning. The air pollution and the water pollution kills a million people a year, and yet the media doesn't pay attention to that. But the possibility that a few people might die from radiation because, and you know, it's partly because nuclear sounds scary. People don't understand radiation. And it's, there's association with nuclear weapons. But I think, you know, it's a question of trying to use that, that, that nuclear genie, genie has been released from the bottle, and it's a question of using it for peaceful purposes and finding safe ways to do it. And that's where the United States government has been very irresponsible. Uh, they, if we don't exercise leadership on making sure that nuclear power is as safe as possible and that it's such that you minimize the danger of proliferation of weapons, then we're, we're going to leave it up to the rest of the world. And the rest of the, there are seven other nations that are working on fourth generation nuclear power. We should not have abandoned that technology because there are ways to make it as safe as possible and there are other ways and we had the best brain power to deal with it, but because it became a political issue and the anti-nukes had such a power in the Democratic Party, they got Clinton and Gore to cancel, to terminate the research on fourth generation nuclear power. Big mistake. That's what I talk about in my book. Okay, that's, the, really subject, that's the subject of a whole nother yes. evening's conversation. I'll just throw in really quickly, um, to defend part of the media, I have written about how coal kills a lot of people, and I, I don't make some of my environmental friends happy about that. But you have, I agree with Jim entirely. You have got, at least to this point, uh, that we have got to be honest about this. And coal is killing thousands and thousands and thousands of people today. The only other thing is that the first time, you might be interested in this, Jim, the first time I heard the phrase global warming was in the year 1981. And can you guess who it was from? a nuclear power industry executive. I was writing my first book on the nuclear industry called Nuclear Inc. And it was 1981. And this, everybody thought after the Three Mile Island accident, this industry was dead. They hadn't had orders in eight years. And, uh, and he said, oh no, we have a long-term future. You wait till the turn of the century. Everybody's gonna realize that coal is a very bad deal because of the global warming. I said, what is that? 1981. 